Hello and a very warm welcome to another Motorsport Magazine podcast. I'm Ed Foster and I'm joined by Motorsports Editor Damien Smith and the great John Surtees. Now John is of course the only man to win world championships on two wheels and four, but he's also a member of the Motorsport Hall of Fame. Why am I mentioning this? Well, we have the brand new Motorsport Hall of Fame just around the corner on Tuesday, May 31st down at Woodcut Park Estate in Surrey, the Royal Automobile Club. Now, what's more, this year, you've been voting in your tens of thousands. And I have the shortlist in front of me, and we're going to talk about each category and all the nominees. And John is going to talk eloquently about all of them, hopefully. Now, we'll get to that in a bit. We also have lots of questions from you, the readers, and lots of well-wishers, uh, which is wonderful to have. But just wanted to give you a few more details on the Hall of Fame. Now, for the first time ever, you can attend the afternoon and evenings entertainment. The afternoon gives you a chance to attend Hall of Fame Live, which is going to include a Q&A with the stars that are there and our editor, Damien Smith, sitting opposite me now. And there will also be cars and bikes running up the hill. Now, I've got a list here of the cars and bikes that are already confirmed, and they are brilliant. We have uh, an X30s 1956 championship winner, the MV Augusta. We have X Moss and Brooks, 57 British GP winner, Van Wall. And we have Moss's C-Type. We've got a Penske PC23. We've got a 750 Monza. It's a fantastic list, and it's growing all the time. So be there in the afternoon to see all of those. Then, of course, the evening, the awards dinner. And this is when we will induct five new members into the Hall of Fame. And there will be a drinks reception and, of course, a three-course dinner. It's a bit I'm most looking forward to, anyway. Now, the guests, obviously, will get to mix with the stars. And just to warn you, there are only 150 tickets available to the pu public to purchase. So please don't delay, and you can find full details on motorsportmagazine.com forward slash Hall of Fame. The stars that you're going to be looking out for, we have John Surtees, of course, Derek Bell, Tom Christensen, Ron Dennis, Jackie Stewart, Jenny Gow will be presenting the evening, and there's Darren Turner, our new Motorsport Magazine columnist, and Guy Edwards. Of course, Guy Edwards is the father of the late Sean Edwards, and Sean Edwards Foundation is our charity partner this year. And we're even getting his car shipped all the way from Germany to be there at the event. Do please join us on Tuesday, May the 31st. It'll be an absolutely fantastic evening, supported by CH Ward Watches and h, &H Auctions. John, a very warm welcome onto the Motorsport Magazine podcast. Um, today, I wanted to do, obviously talk through the Hall of Fame nominees, um, a club that you are already a member of, quite rightly too. Um, the public have been voting in their tens of thousands, actually, and we have come up with a list of top threes in each category. So we'll go through those in a bit. But with uh, sort of a light on the present, um, looking back at the past, we've actually had a lot of readers' questions in, and uh, a couple of them are concerning Honda. Obviously, McLaren teamed up with them at the moment, and things are going a bit better this year, but not, not that great. Um, Jonathan Abbott was asking, what was Honda's biggest limiting factor when you were working with them? Um, was it their technical knowledge, or simply the difficulty in competing in a European-based ba championship with them over in Japan? Was it, was it very difficult working with Honda, or, or not as bad as, as people make out? Well, of course, you've got to remember that the Honda of then is a very different Honda to today. The Honda then was very much controlled by Mr. Honda, and he had his philosophy about how he used motorsport. Uh, he came in on motorcycles, obviously, and largely he looked upon motorsport as developing people, creating people to go through and create the future of Honda. And so R&D, uh, was a factor and in my case relative to the time I joined them um, it can be a long story but I'll try and keep it very short when Mr Nakamura approached me after I'd won the Mexican Grand Prix in 1966 and said John uh, we've decided we want you to drive for the team and we want you to help organize the team and give it a base in England and if you don't, we'll stop racing. Uh, I said, well, that's a little bit drastic, but on the basis of the fact that Cooper Maserati, that I just won with, uh, had said that there was doubts about them continuing, 
because of engine supply, whether Maserati would continue, uh, I thought, well, they've done it on motorcycling. Why can't they do it on cars? So, um, and I'd been uh, impressed with the one and a half litre. I thought that had been a, uh, a superb car, uh, quite courageous in coming along with the whole uh, design outlet. And um, why not? Uh, the problem was, of course, the car that I was presented with. Uh, the car had been designed and was a little bit outdated. Uh, the engineers had looked at old technology. It was based largely on, uh, well, virtually pre-war alpha technology. It had uh, a uh, full roller bearing crankshaft engine, uh, which uh, of course made it rather longer and heavier. It also had a uh, three shaft gearbox uh, in it uh, to uh, uh, fit with this and the car weighed you know you hear nowadays about the odd pounds of fuel but the car weighed 180 pounds more than the opposition and so we were problems the second problem uh, apart from that weight uh, which was confronted with was the actual uh, motor characteristics in that it appeared to be quite good at the top, but we were never quite sure about how it would perform in the mid-range because of the uh, low pressure, virtually Indianapolis type uh, fuel injection. And if the sun came out, uh, it would perform one way. If it was cold, it would perform another way. It, it changed drastically. So we tried to change that and in fact, uh, Mr. Honda uh, said, no, no, uh, that's it. Uh, I'm afraid uh, that um, I did manage to do a little modification, which was to up it and uh, to keep the gauge still reading low. <laughs> so uh, that made an improvement in it. And in fact, the car came together quite well for such a, such a heavy car. And the engine, uh, when it was singing, uh, you know, Apart from making a rather nice noise, uh, it was uh, it, it was good, but very much overweight. But they said, no, we'll make something fresh. We'll make something fresh. Well, I pressured. I'd had enough after a little while. And I said, look, is it, we're wasting our time. You know, we've got to do something. So I had carried out a development program with George Bignotti and... Uh, also uh, Lola, uh, on the Indy Lapis car uh, for the uh, 1966 race. Uh, of course, uh, I hadn't been able to do that race uh, because uh, I had my dreadful accident in Canada uh, in the Can-Am car. And I had to concentrate on coming back to Ferrari for that year. but. What was quite nice, Graham Hill won the race uh, with a car that I'd partly helped develop, so that was good. But I thought of it and I thought, that chassis could have suitability. Uh, so I took the idea to Nakamura and he spoke to Mr. Kawamoto, who was a sort of like a fairly new engineer uh, on the uh, team at that time. And uh, we went and saw Eric Broadley. And we said, can we do it? And Eric, the team looked at it and said, well, yes, but we need to be a joint affair here. You know, uh, Japan will have to come in. So uh, Mr. Nakamura went off to Japan to get, uh, to put the idea. And surprisingly, we got a yes. And so uh, this was all go, this was all excitement. And uh, so we uh, had, uh, the uh, chassis engineers from uh, uh, Tokyo I sort of come over and look and work together and we decided what would be, would be built in Japan and what would be built in England and there's this crash program to get a car ready. And of course, uh, it's history now in that uh, we did manage to get it together and uh, it uh, was uh, 
rather uh, uh, a pleasant first race for it in that uh, we uh, managed to win it at Monza. Uh, it uh, worked worked well, uh, virtually right out of the box. Uh, that sort of work we'd done at uh, Indy and the rest of it was all very good. And uh, of course, Eric and his team were quite competent as well. So uh, it, uh, you know, that was, a, that was superb. And we thought, ah, now's the answer. Uh, we can build from this and we'll get a new lightweight engine. They said, you'll get a new engine. Uh, Shorter, smaller, more compact, uh, also go back to a, a more conventional gearbox and we'll lose all the weight. Well, that didn't come. But we got an interim engine, which was uh, updated, partly similar to how they had built the Formula 2 engine that Jack Brabham had so much success with. Uh, this was torsion bars, uh, springs, valve springs, etc. And uh, that new engine uh, with officially slightly higher increased uh, fuel injection pressures again uh, came about and was, was better. And into this, um, we uh, put it into a chassis that uh, wasn't built at Lola. Uh, this was uh, built basically on the design uh, who we took on of Derek White. Derek White had been uh, the engineer I'd worked with when I went to Cooper uh, for the Cooper Maserati. And Derek came along and joined us and we put together this uh, chassis, uh, which... Uh, Okay, it still didn't solve all the problems, but still was a good chassis. And in fact, uh, one of my long-term uh, mechanics, not so long ago, said to me, he said, John, you know we had the World Championship there in 1967. He said, it was all possible. I said, N I know, I know, because in fact, we did have a potential win the World Championship, but um, we suffered from part of gain of the Honda philosophy uh, because we had quite a turnover of where you would come along and on this uh, uh, cause of wanting to train and develop engineers and that and for the future, uh, you'd have someone come along who they would check out the fuel consumption and do all the bits and pieces. Uh, these uh, used to be called mechanics in those days, uh, with their slide rules, etc. Uh, but uh, with a screwdriver and a spanner, they weren't necessarily quite as good. And so, uh, after having a reverse gear fallout when I was leading in Monaco, uh, because the bolt hadn't been put in uh, uh, correctly, and then uh, the rear link come off at uh, Spa when I game where I was leading, uh, uh, because that hadn't been quite uh, put together right. Uh, you know, we went on a little this that year that way. Uh, the sad thing was that. This was all investment in a way in a future. I looked upon this as a, as sort of being my last family. I looked upon Ferrari as being it, and before the upset, I looked upon this as being my last family type of thing, uh, because in a way it's like a family. It was like a family affair in those days uh, with the teams. But um, out of the blue. Uh, I'd been waiting for this new lightweight V12. This was the thing which I thought, ah, oh, that will be the thing to really dominate. And I'm sure we can, we can do that. But it didn't arrive. What arrived instead was something which had been uh, created in a way to fit in with certain commercial uh, developments which are taking place in Japan regarding certain uh, production cars and uh, 
It had gone away from a continuous development on the same theme into an entirely new one, and we had the air and oil called V8 arrive. Uh, I tested it at both uh, Silverstone, uh, Goodwood, and uh, also uh, Monza. And uh, although there were certain aspects of the car which were worth future uh, development, certainly, I mean, perhaps if that little car had been cr uh, created into a, uh, a uh, standard water-cooled V8 engine, it could have been perhaps potentially very good. Uh, but uh, it wasn't fit to race, and so... Um, I said, no, no, uh, we can't do this. Uh, it's inferior to our existing car, so that's it. Well, unfortunately, uh, decisions were taken to run it against that advice, and um, that brought about, with the unfortunate accident to Joe Slesser, uh, that brought about the notice, sorry, program stopped. and. Uh, my sort of, in a way, dreams and aspirations of uh, Honda uh, were in. But at the same time, you know, uh, some of the people I worked with and everything else, and what was so nice is that when uh, I think it was uh, Mansell was successful at Brands Hatch uh, with the uh, McLaren Honda, I got a note back. Uh, I got a note from uh, Akume, who was by then president of it, saying, uh, this uh, wouldn't have been possible without you. So, uh, and I've, I stayed in contact with those particular uh, people, uh, uh, Kume and Ka Mr. Kawamoto, uh, and uh, Mr. Nakamura unfortunately passed away, uh, but he was a, a, a great guy. and. Uh, and and the team is a whole bunch there who were uh, there and just as disappointed as me that it didn't work out and we didn't reach our full potential. A, a story of sort of, of missed opportunities, um, but the I just uh, we've got so much to get through. But I wanted to just ask one quick. I went yes on probably too long. No, no, it's great. It's great. The um, I was going to ask one yes or no question. Do you think current Honda and McLaren will win world championships? You want a very brief answer? Do, uh, go on, yes or no? What do no. you think? No. Interesting, interesting. Um, now, Hall of Fame, we really must get on to talking about the Hall of Fame and, and some of the nominees. I thought what we'd do is we'd start with um, a category that's obviously very close to your heart, the motorcycling category. And the top three are, um, the, well, the man who's got all the record books at his mercy, Valentino Rossi, Mike the Bike Halewood, and the most successful man in the Isle of Man TT, Joey Dunlop. Um, you obviously won plenty of races, six races in the Isle of Man, um, I think your first one in 56, a, t a total of 26 wins from Joey Dunlop, and I mean, it's an incredible achievement, wasn't it? Well, of course, um, yes, it is incredible, uh, but that is, of course, the way the Isle of Man went. Uh, you have a situation where you have, the Isle of Man used to be part of the, t of the formula, uh, uh, Five, well, 500, 350, 250, 125, etc. championship, the world championships. And so uh, you came along and uh, you would do the Dutch Grand Prix, the Belgian Grand Prix and the Isle of Man, and they would all classify for points for that championship. And so it was a must to do. I... Uh, went there because it was a, a major challenge as well. A lot of the riders who came along didn't like to do the Isle of Man uh, and would prefer just to stick to the continental circuit. So that's where, so it came to an end. So with it coming to an end as a championship race, uh, what has happened is that you've had specialists, i.e. riders who have, and if you've got 37 and a half miles, right, it's, it's vital that you have a, a, a picture in your mind of virtually every foot of a circuit. 
uh, because that is uh, at the speeds and everything you're doing, that sort of uh, picture which you have there all in there dictates everything, how you ride uh, through there and where you are on the road, etc. So the more you race there, in a way, the, more the safer you become and to a degree the faster you will become. Because the fact is, you just become more, um, um, uh, uh, if it's possible, more relaxed all the time in the surroundings, and they're so familiar. So it's become a very specialist race uh, for people who have uh, done the race so very frequently. So it's a very different picture to where you came along and had it as a race which was for the world championship. Um, and, and you know, a man who you, you knew very well, Mike Helwood, is also another another nominee. What are your sort of fondest memories of of Mike the bike? Well, Mike came back to me uh, on his uh, the Isle of Man. It comes a point when he talked about returning. Mike came to me and said, "What do you think, John?" And I said, well, "I think it's a bit balmy, really, uh, but uh, if you're going to do it." you've got to be careful what bike. I said, because you've got to go back, you've got to go and switch on to something which you have a program for, something which isn't too dissimilar to what you've done in the past. Uh, and uh, there, uh, the choice which came out of a Ducati was ideal. This was perfect because it was rather like a, a big Norton to ride. And uh, he said that. And so, um, again, this thing rather like Joey, because Mike had so much knowledge, he switched on that program he had of the Isle of Man. And because it hadn't been uh, changed too much, apart from taking the odd uh, corners off uh, here and there, um, he was able to sort of drop into the groove and have that uh, tremendous return. So that, that, was, that was great. But Mike, um, of course, I knew him from his uh, motorcycle days because his first successes uh, in, in many ways were also gained on bikes that had come from me. Uh, my little 250 NSU that I'd uh, had a lot of success here in the UK with on all the British circuits, his dad uh, came along and said, you know, can we borrow it? Uh, for the uh, races in South Africa this uh, winter, etc. And so, um, yeah, yeah. I, I let him do that because NSU asked me if it would help them because his dad was a very big motorcycle dealer with Kings of Oxford. And so I let him do it. I didn't see the bike again. <laughs> but, but that's another story. Uh, but uh, he had a, a successful time, and also some Nortons. And of course, his uh, father tended to have a program of following along a little in my footsteps because uh, he then asked me about MV, and he went to MV uh, and uh, had a great time. And then uh, he jumped, of course, uh, into four wheels. He jumped into a Lola, uh, which had been the car that uh, I'd driven uh, in 1962. Uh, and so, uh, and this was with uh, Tim Parnell, I believe, uh, Tim Parnell's team. So um, it uh, was there. And nice thing about Mike was that one, he was a great enthusiast. He, he loved what he was doing. He couldn't imagine uh, uh, doing anything other than what he was doing, riding a bike or driving a car. Uh, and you could, uh, you know, he, he was dead honest. Uh, or his dealings always with me. Uh, we didn't sort of have to go along and have fast contracts and things like that. And it's one of the saddest things in my life. And, and as it turned out, a mistake was when I was forced uh, not to continue with him uh, in my Formula One team. Uh, but that was purely the pressure of a sponsor who came along, and I put it to Mike, who said, uh, no, we want a Carlos Pachi. Brazil is a good market. 
and Germany is a good market. We want a German and Brazilian driver. And I had the option of this opportunity, I thought, uh, which was to do so many extra things on the team. Uh, and uh, and what with Mike. So fortunately, uh, Rob Walker, who uh, had been involved with us, partly with the team, uh, found a solution. So uh, that solution was to put Mike in a McLaren car. And, uh, but it was sad because, uh, you know, Mike had uh, had a w wonderful time winning the European Championship in our TS10 uh, and uh, always giving of his all, uh, which was nice to see because uh, drivers aren't all that way. Uh, Mike always gave of his all, which is uh, tremendous. And uh, I have uh, a warm affection for him. John, um, we know how, how great he was on bikes, and in, in cars he had notable success, the F2 Championship, the obvious thing. Um, how good do you think he could have been? Do you think he, he could have been a, a, a regular Grand Prix winner in time? Well, he was lucky, uh, unlucky not to be a Grand Prix winner in one of our cars, uh, in, that, um, in that sort of rather close finish there in... Uh, what was it, 60? 71. Uh, in 71. Mm. In 71. Um, you know, if those uh, spring uh, straps on the air box hadn't, hadn't come off and lost him sort of about 300 revs, uh, of course, he would have been a winner. Uh, but, um, you know, that is one of those things in racing. And there's uh, one or two other occasions where uh, he was in with a chance. So, um, yes, I, I, I think uh, Mike uh, could have been a winner, certainly, uh, because uh, he had natural speed and uh, he had enthusiasm and drive uh, to take him through. John, um, the, the, the final nominee in uh, the motorcycling cat category is Rossi. And we always marvel at the magazine how long he's been at the top of his game. You know, d you competed at the top of your game for almost, well, it's the same amount of time, actually, as he has now, 20 years. How, how difficult is that for someone like Rossi with all these young guys coming in and s putting pressure on him week in, week out? How do you, how do, you do that? <laughs> well, when he was testing with Ferrari and things, I had quite a few talks with him. Not, not out there in Maranello, but back here in uh, England. We had talks about it and the rest of it, but his main love was still the two wheels. Uh, I think one of the things that is very special about what Rossi has done has been uh, how he's been able to cope with the technology. Because it's one thing to go along and ride a bike, and we talked earlier about those programs you have, but bikes, basically stayed uh, fairly conventional, the way you rode them and the way everything worked, up until a stage of where computers started coming in. And then uh, you saw the sort of age of, I say, Marquez uh, coming in, where the computer age took over, where uh, you didn't go along and uh, normally if it, it starts to move a little on the back and the rest of it, uh, you didn't control it by just sort of easing the throttle and steadying the bike. You often, uh, I understand, and I haven't done this myself, but I understand that you sort of wound it on and let the computer take over and have faith. Well, where you've been totally in control yourself and at everything the bike has done in the past, sensing it through the seat of your pants and the tips of your fingers, to go along and then put your faith in the computer is a massive change. It's, a, it's not so much of a change for those youngsters coming up who have uh, lived with computers right from uh, their sort of uh, shortly after birth, uh, like you've seen even in Formula One. People say, ah, oh, yes, uh, I can drive a Formula One car because I've spent so much time on my computer. And so he has done a wonderful job uh, in coming to grips with 
the modern uh, form of uh, a motorcycle racing a bike uh, as against previously. So um, that's very special and something uh, which n not many people will be able to do. John, you said you spoke to Valentino quite a bit during that Ferrari period and it looked for a while like he was actually contemplating the switch. I mean, uh, we all wanted it to happen, I think, because of the, the intrigue of seeing him do it. Um, how close do you think he got to it? Did, was he serious about it at the time? I think, uh, I think uh, despite uh, at times not appearing to be all that serious about things, I think he's very, very serious about his racing. I think the situation came about in that uh, he had this wonderful opportunity, and this existed in those days, of course, uh, it was, it's a shame that today it doesn't, of sitting in, you know, Michael Schumacher's car, et cetera, on the same circuit, going out and testing and being able to look at the data uh, that Michael had done, looking at the data he did and others did, etc. cetera. Um, I think it came down to one thing. I think it came down to, frankly, the stopwatch. And that in the end, uh, he wasn't satisfied with what he was able to do and thought, no, uh, rather than be a small fish in a big pond, I'd rather be a big one, it must be very as, I am, as I am, as yeah. I am in, uh, in uh, motorcycle. Yeah, it must be very hard going from being the benchmark in one Absolutely. arm of the sport to... Yes, yeah. I, I think, I, so I think in the end it was a stopwatch. Mm. John, I'm going to, um, after each of these categories, I'm going to ask uh, who you'd like to induct out of the three we've just been talking about. Um, obviously, it's, it's down to the public, um, but if, if the say was yours, who would you go for between Rossi, Hellwood, and Joey Dunlop? Well, of course, it's a little unfair, really, because I'm biased. <laughs> I'm biased. I'm biased, so from that point of view... We all uh, are, don't worry. Fun? I think we all are to yeah, some extent. So, so the fact is, uh, from that point of view, I'd have to say Mike, wouldn't I? Uh, I mean, it is um, a question of, uh, you know, Joey did this wonderful thing. And, and for Ireland, of course, fantastic. Because uh, that enthusiasm which I saw when I first ever went, to, uh, when I went to my first ever Grand Prix, uh, which was the Ulster Grand Prix, uh, uh, was... Uh, you know, infectious, and, uh, and the number of riders which have come out of Ireland uh, has again been quite fantastic. So uh, that was tremendous, and of course, uh, Rossi, his is record speaks for itself, but uh, because of that association and two and four wheels and what we've shared together, etc., uh, it's... Uh, it would have to be Mike. Well, just mentioning there the, the two wheels and four wheels, um, I've actually got a question here from Neil, um, who recalls an interview that you did a while ago when you said you were talking to Mike Hawthorne at a dinner, and he suggested that you should try cars because they stand up better. And uh, Neil wants to know how did the skill set of riding motorcycles transfer into cars? You were mentioning Rossi there, and it didn't quite work. How, d how did you transfer your bike skills to the, to the cars? Well, the first race car I sat in uh, was the DBR1, Aston Martin, that Sterling Moss had won the uh, Nürburgring with. Um, this was a works car uh, with that connection, uh, uh, early connection being made uh, with uh, Reg Parnell, who was team manager. And after I'd done a few laps, Reg offered me a contract. Um, I didn't have, in any car I sat in, I didn't have a problem in uh, doing a time. Uh, doing a time, I was able to do that. The only thing is, I didn't know entirely what I was doing. Uh, it, so uh, there was sort of a number of things where I, I obviously had to just learn from experience. But uh, the biggest single thing is, if you go from one environment to another, uh, is knowing that environment. Uh, knowing the people, knowing the people on the track, how you can treat them, and uh, you have to, they're, they're all different, they're all different, and knowing the people off the track. And I came into a strange world 
which I'd never touched before. So uh, that is where the main dangers lay, uh, purely in how you deal with the people factor. Uh, but uh, dealing with a car, uh, tremendous amount of extra uh, attention and, uh, and concentration. It was much more tiring to start with. Uh, right, uh, driving a car for a simple reason is that I was sort of uh, didn't have a program. I didn't click in and it all come automatically so everything was happening faster for me and with that experience of course it all slows up and the program comes together and, and you can often go along and you act first and think second as a stage you have to get to. Um, we, we must plough on with because we've got another four categories to get get through. Um, on to Formula One, and the top three uh, nominees in that are the engine manufacturer, which changed the face of of Grand Prix racing, uh, it's Cosworth. Um, so that's Mike Coston and Keith Duckworth. Um, the crazy diamond Gilles Villeneuve, and the much loved uh, Professor Sid Watkins. Um, starting with Cosworth, how aware of sort of you know the DFV when it came in in '66? Where you, I mean, did, did everyone know immediately that this was just the thing to have, and what a clever creation it was, or did that take a few years? Well, of course, you've got to remember the British motor uh, racing industry uh, wouldn't have come about if it hadn't have been for first of all Coventry Climax, and then uh, for Ford, and and. Um, the uh, support of uh, for Cosworth. Um, both presented a major problem to the traditional companies like Ferrari. And the problem was that if you were driving for someone like Ferrari, uh, you were competing against the best of the Coventry Climaxes. Uh, and the same with the when the Ford came in. So uh, they uh, took the stage up because they made very usable engines, engines which had a nice mid-range and a nice power curve, which made the car uh, that much easier and uh, better to drive. Uh, so uh, that was um, that was a major fillip to Grand Prix racing and allowed all these teams to develop, uh, which um, transformed the racing. If you think back to 67, April 67, when Lotus pitched up at Zandvoort with the, the DFV and they won first time out and of course after that, a lot of reliability problems, so Lotus didn't, uh, didn't win that championship that year. Um, but what was... Do you remember thinking back at the time about the impact the DFV had and how impressed uh, Formula One were and, and you, you personally from uh, uh, those days? Well, it was a wake-up call. Uh, it was a wake-up call. Uh, and uh, it all sort of pointed and the others just needed a notice. And uh, you said uh, about uh, sort of 67, and you go along and see a compact a car and a sort of the power-to-weight ratio of, uh, of the Lotus Cosworth and uh, it was a very hard package to beat. Yeah, yeah. And Costin and Duckworth as, as individuals, I mean... Um, uh and in all these things, you have to have driving forces. Mm. Uh, I mean, Ferrari wouldn't be there if it hadn't been for Enzo Ferrari. And uh, his sort of particular way of driving through uh, and creating his company. Uh, the same thing with Honda. Uh, they're individuals and I uh, I've been privileged to actually work with, with both of them, not just his name, but Keith Duckworth and uh, uh, Costain, of course, uh, and the other team, uh, because people like Benny Rudd and the rest of it all sort of came in. Um, they are uh, very special. They were very special and they had that driving force and they had that ability and they harnessed the two things together and... Uh, The important thing being that they realised what was needed by a driver. And, uh, and so they put together, and of course, with Colin Chapman, they had somebody who also uh, understood it. I mean, he, Colin could jump in a car and go 
you know, virtually as quick as anybody. And so, you know, Colin understood uh, what was needed, and between them all, they had this package, and they gave this rather nice uh, thing of where uh, you may have a car which perhaps isn't perfectly set up, but if you've got a, an engine which is there and is very responsive under that right foot of yours and able to sort of adapt, adapt the car as you want to and the rest of it, it, it makes a wonderful uh, difference to uh, the whole scene. Um, th the second nominee, uh, who I described as a crazy diamond, I think I actually have to uh, nod my uh, head to Simon Aaron for that phrase, because I think I've, I pulled it from the magazine. Um, I just think it's a lovely way to... It was actually a, a front cover of the magazine about... Um, Ten years ago or so, and they sorry, used Simon, it, it, it wasn't you. Then. <laughs> it was uh, yeah, Paul Fernley came up with it, and it, I always thought it was a perfect, uh, perfect way to describe him. Yeah, was, uh, was it was he a crazy diamond to you? I mean, he's you know when he first arrived at Ferrari, he was he had actually quite a difficult time, and you were so loved by the Ferrari fans. What what were your memories of when you first saw Villeneuve at, at Ferrari? Uh, well, of course, I never had any direct contact at all. Uh, it was. Uh, Something which uh, all I've go on is uh, what I've been sort of told and what I've seen. And uh, I know very well out of Ferrari there is quite a rivalry uh, for attention and affection uh, between him and uh, what, Peroni? Yes. And, and Peroni, mm -hmm. uh, etc. Uh, and that was quite intense, I understand. That's what I always sensed. But. Uh, uh, you only really uh, understand these people and know them if you're actually there competing against them uh, and uh, working directly with them. And I, I didn't uh, ever have that uh, possibility. I think one, one of the things that Gilles shared with you and maybe with Chris Amon um, is that few drivers really had that relationship with Enzo. Uh, they had a personal close relationship where they actually um, had an affinity, and y you had that, Gilles had that. Um, do you think that that made a difference uh, if you were at Ferrari? Um, it was, uh, yes, it made a difference in that it was pleasing at times and frustrating at others. Uh, it was a, a case of where, um, you know, Ferrari was a person of many moods and changes of situations. Uh, I never quite appreciated perhaps some of the pressures on him uh, that uh, he did have. Uh, when I became a team owner and etc., I knew a lot more. But uh, he was kind of keeping awful little balls in the air uh, at Ferrari, uh, was Enzo. And uh, this uh, meant that he uh, did all sorts of things, sometimes somewhat unorthodox. But no, it was still uh, yeah, good to have that relationship. And I understand he had that relationship at the same time. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, Peroni also had uh, a quite a good relationship. So that's, that's good uh, because after all, uh, Far Far is uh, a, a name which today is, uh, without Ferrari, you can't imagine Formula One. Um, talking of Formula One, it's, you know, it's a sport that has changed. It's, I mean, it's almost a different sport nowadays to, to the sport that you competed in back in the, back in the 60s. Um, Professor Sid Watkins is, I would say, a huge part of changing that for the better. Um, how, how much do you current drivers have to thank Sid for all the tireless changes and work that he put in to, to sort of, I would say, revolutionizing the sport? I think that's fair enough. Well, of course, again, Sid came after my time, but... Uh was a very welcome addition. And Sid, I knew Sid, uh, and I got to know him in latter years in particular, and uh, a great person, a great guy who, you know, his tremendous enthusiasm for getting the job done, and what he achieved was tremendous. Uh, that was something. And uh, I think that two major things all happened. You had space technology, which came along and brought about all sorts of uh, new materials and new techniques uh, which could be adapted, which with the increase in income which came into Formula One because of TV and all the other rights uh, which 
suddenly became uh, a very major factor in the uh, budget side. Um, the engineers and the rest were able to create the safety cell, and they had the safety cell together with uh, what uh, Sid Watkins was on the side back in the racing up with, and this was a tremendous advancement. These, uh, relative to safety, I mean, that was something which was, uh, you, you wouldn't have dreamt of. But uh, Sid, uh, again, individual. An individual, because it's not just a question that he was employed to do this, but he actually had his heart in it. And he was a driving force in creating what was achieved. Yeah, it's, it's worth remembering that he, he still had a full-time job. And, you know, he used to fly out to the Grand Prix on his days mm. off. It's amazing. That was incredible. Um, just before we move on to sports cars, uh, decision between Cosworth, Villeneuve and Watkins. John, who would, who would you go for? Cosworth? I'm very tempted by that because uh, I envied uh, some of the time those drivers who had a DFE in the back. Uh, uh, but... Uh, and, uh, and what they did uh, in Formula One was tremendous. But probably because of other factors in my life, et cetera, um, I'd have to go for Sid. A very, very fine choice. Yeah, I'd have to, I think so. Uh, Sid, uh, because uh, he was there for everybody. Not just a person who had a Cosworth in the back. Uh, he was there for everybody. And so I think that that uh, was a, a special time. So the sports cars, the top three in this category are five-time Le Mans winner Derek Bell, the great Brian Redman. And uh, thank you, Simon, for these words that follow. Fierce, fast and brave Pedro Rodriguez. Um, <coughs> you raced against Rodriguez in F1 and sports cars. What was he... What was he like as a competitor? Was he as fiery as uh, everyone says? Yeah. Well, in a way, I uh, we nearly crossed swords at our very first event, and not, not as drivers, but I'd done all the testing for the new uh, P car at Ferrari. It's one of the first jobs I was given. Uh, get the figure, and. One of the cars, uh, they said, well, uh, your car, okay, uh, which I was going to share with Scafiotti. We both uh, sorted out our driving position and everything else. That was our car. We got to Sebring, and uh, that car was given to um, the uh, American team for Mr. Rodriguez, uh, because Luigi Canetti, of course, was a great... A uh, friend of uh, Enzo Ferrari, and uh, his, uh, and so they ended up with uh, our car. So that was it. But no, uh, Pedro extremely competent, extremely competent, and uh, someone you could sort of never um, sort of uh, take your eyes off it uh, because you weren't quite sure what he would. Uh, be able to do, but no, no, uh, extremely competent driver. What was he like as a as a chap? Because obviously, uh, very different background coming from Mexico. Uh, he had a you know, wealthy father, um, but he, he came to Britain and he seemed to in integrate himself into the into the British motor racing community very well. Well, yes, um, but that's one of the things you say: uh, integrated himself with the British racing community. When you are actually driving for Ferrari, Ferrari you tend to be a little bit isolated from that. You tend to be uh, out there, Marinello, etc., and you're in the world of Ferrari. And so despite the fact that he'd often drive for um, uh, Luigi Canetti, uh, etc., uh, he uh, was a little out of it, and I never had much to do with him. The main time we came together was actually when we raced against each other on the track. So, uh, uh, otherwise, other than that, uh, uh, I, I didn't have um, too much to do. D on to Derek Bell, uh, five wins at Le Mans. You obviously finished at the podium at Le Mans. How, you know, to win five times at that race, what, it's, um, it, I don't think it, it got a little bit easier to compete, uh, to complete um, in, in Derek's era, but how much of an achievement is that with, you know, with your knowledge of racing there and sports cars? 
Uh, well, Derek Bell, of course, I also remember because uh, he uh, got his only world championship points driving a 30s Formula One car. Uh, so uh, that was good. But Derek, uh, one of those drivers who uh, came in that period, I suppose, when uh, I still came in a period, the end, where if you were quick enough, you would get a drive. Uh, unfortunately, things turned round, and that wasn't just enough. And uh, I know even when he drove for my team, I'd love to have kept him, but uh, we couldn't find a sponsorship. So that wasn't it. Uh, but, uh, no, a very complete driver, uh, someone who... Uh, didn't just sort of relate to a car, uh, but also uh, was able to really sort of think it out as well. And that's what showed in what he's been able to do for the teams. Uh, I think that uh, his whole sort of uh, approach and mentality uh, was, uh, you know, superb in putting the team together, which in turn had so much success. And uh, he would have had a major contribution to doing it. So I, I, I'm very uh, enthusiastic about uh, what Derek w achieved and uh, um, uh, what uh, type of person he is. Do you think he had, would have had a, a brighter future in Formula One if things had turned out differently? I think he could have done. It would be nice to have had uh, a consistent um, a drive available to him. At the same time, um, there's lots of forms of racing and he's achieved what he has done in sports car racing. So perhaps he was meant to do that uh, in life. Uh, I also believe that circumstances tend to take us in, uh, often in uh, the ways that uh, we're meant to excel in. And uh, I think that he, uh, Obviously, excelled in the sports cars and a, and a contr contribution he's able to make to the team. So, uh, perhaps that's the place where uh, he was meant to be. And, and on to the final nominee in sports cars, Brian Redmond, um, also a fellow competitor. When, when someone mentions Brian Redmond to you, what, what are your sort of first memories and, and thoughts of him, the famous Lancastrian? Brian, well, again extremely competent driver. Uh, I sort of came together with Brian when he was running some of his events over in America, uh, etc., with great enthusiasm. Uh, no, uh, again, uh, a sort of approach, probably not so much dissimilar to Derek's, uh, to uh, the whole thing. And uh, he uh, was obviously able to relate to a car, Anybody who has successes in the 24 hours uh, is someone who uh, will be relatively, it may push it hard, but at the same time push it hard in a kind way. Uh, won't go along and abuse things. And I think this goes in the sort of mentality of the person concerned and their whole makeup. And there's some drivers who frankly you think 24 hours, you wouldn't let them loose in that. But uh, uh, certainly uh, Brian was one who, uh, again, uh, found his niche uh, in that type of racing. When I, um, I let Brian know that he was a, a contender for the Hall of Fame this year and that he was in the sports car category, he took a little bit of umbrage because he, he always thinks of himself as a, as a Formula 5000 driver. He, always, he said that he, I think one of the things he's most proud of is, is beating Andretti to the, the F5000 titles in the, in the States. I mean, he was one of these guys who was an all-rounder um, and you were another, you know, racing in Formula 1 single-seaters, Can-Am, uh, sports car racing in, in Europe. Um, what does it take for a driver to be able to adapt to those different uh, different uh, areas of the sport? Oh, well, uh, it's like you asked me earlier on about uh, going from bikes to cars. Uh, you've got to remember that um, cars and motorcycles and uh, of, of any type uh, were very different today. You didn't have a load of data available to look at. It was a case of where 
you drove a car or you rode a bike and the only messages that the engineers or anybody back there in the pits got uh, relative to improving it or, uh, <coughs> or carrying on uh, changes to it can come from the driver. The driver was the only one uh, relating it and uh, that uh, as well as things like a stopwatch uh, and uh, a little later the tire pressures etc and tire temperatures these are the things which started to come in but uh, so in a way uh, the driver that seat of the pants and that feel through the hands uh, is a was a very very vital ingredient uh, there wasn't any other check apart from that so when he sat in, he would have had a, a program I on about this. And after a while, uh, uh, he would have jumped in one car and he would have had a program relative to that type of car. And he would have adapted it to a different make, perhaps, uh, of that type. But then a Formula uh, 5000 car, again, a Formula 5000 car will be driven differently to a Formula 1. Both single-seaters, but quite different characteristics uh, relative to power, uh, etc. Uh, much larger engines, much more torque with the Formula 5000 engine. Uh, so um, it's a case of uh, uh, that there are some people who can adapt to anything. There's other people who are perhaps a little bit single-minded and uh, just find it difficult to do so, but generally uh, people like the Brian Redmonds, uh, etc., and the Derek Bells uh, would be able to drive most things. Um, John, it's time to put you on the spot again, uh, asking who you'd induct out of, th out of those three, Rodriguez, Bell, and Redmond. I'd have to take Derek. Good stuff. It's 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 great getting a decision so quickly. The, the public have been taking about four months trying to make their decisions. So <laughs> um, it's good to get one so quickly. Um, I am wary that we have 15 minutes left and two yeah. categories to talk to and lots of readers' questions. So I'm just going to jump straight on to the US racing. Um, top three, the wonderful Dan Gurney, um, the man who won almost everything there was, AJ Foyt, and also the captain, Roger Pansky. Um Dan Gurney, a very fierce competitor of yours, I think it's fair to say. Um, what, what was he like to drive against? Oh, Dan, uh, apart from being a great enthusiast, I mean, he was, uh, people used to describe him as a bubbling sort of uh, schoolboy, uh, his enthusiasm. But uh, Dan, someone who's often been underrated, Dan was certainly uh, one of the uh, top persons, uh, certainly the top persons of my period, and one who you could never discount. With Dan, you're never quite sure what he could produce. Uh, he could produce an absolute startling performance. And uh, I have uh, you know, a great uh, appreciation of him relative to his ability, his enthusiasm, and also uh, how he's also wanting to always delve into the unknown when it comes to designs. Some of the sort of... Uh, motorcycle uh, things he's come up with uh, I sort of uh, blink about at times and of course I mean his uh, record as a, as a uh, constructor uh, working with his own Formula One car etc and uh, also the Indy cars is something which is very special so Dan uh, yes uh, a, a, a very special competitor I well, use that word purposely, competitor, because he is uh, a real competitor. We, we've had a question in from Martin Tomlinson, and uh, before the question, he actually says, many years ago you told me that in cars your toughest opposition came from Clark and Chapman and Gurney and Brabham, um, and obviously Clark and Chapman as, a, as an entity. So it goes some way to, to explaining just how, um, how much of a, sort of, as you said, a constant threat that he was. Yes, I mean, that's it. He, uh, no, uh, he... Uh, would be competitive at most things because he puts his full heart into everything and uh, I uh, you know uh, th there's 
those that you uh, have an uh, awful lot of respect for and you never took for granted. If you were in a race, uh, you always kept an eye on certain people in particular, and Dan was one of those. Um, sorry, Damien. I was just going to say, John, what, a, what an era you raced, raced in during the, the 60s, given, given who you, you, you try and come up with a list of the top drivers, and you've got yourself, Jimmy Clark, uh, Dan, Jack Brabham, Graham Hill. It just goes on and on, doesn't it? And then Jackie Stewart comes in. You know, Sterling wasn't around for long enough, unfortunately. During Sterling at the very beginning of my career. Yeah, yeah. Sterling at the very beginning of my career, and uh, he uh, yeah, he went out in that race when I was running the Lola mm. at the beginning, and we both ended up with a lap record together yeah. uh, at the Goodwood in that race which he went out in. We both had pit stops, but uh, yes, um, the sort of determination uh, and that uh, not quite sure quite what they would get up to. Probably the, the, of the ones you've mentioned, uh, probably Jack Brabham and Dan Gurney uh, are the ones which are mostly linked there. Uh, some of the others were a little more conventional in uh, uh, how they were. And then, of course, A.J. Foyt and Roger Penske. Um, what, what springs to mind with those two sort of colossus from the, uh, the other side of the pond? Well, A.J. Foyt, of course, I mean, his record is a rather special one, etc. Uh, I don't have direct knowledge of him uh, because I never competed against him or uh, was in that scene. Uh, but uh, a very special name and for American motorsport, uh, you know, a legend. But um, of course, uh, uh, Roger Penske uh, is someone who has shown such ability on the track and off the track uh, because everything you uh, uh, sort of see around uh, in motorsport is connection still today uh, with Roger. And uh, he's been a major, major force in America. And also, of course, with his influences over here, uh, with what he's done and involved with. So, uh, no, uh, I came across him uh, in sports cars, etc. Extremely good driver, uh, etc. But uh, he uh, you know, didn't, from his own personal point of view, uh, get involved with Formula One during my period at all. But of course, I guess you mentioned the sports cars. He, he, his first foray into Europe was with over here in the, the, the Zerex Special, which was essentially a, a Cooper single seater. You know, even then, he knew all about the unfair advantage that Mark Donoghue would make famous later on in his career. Um, and do you remember the the impact that that Roger had when he came over with that car? And shook I remember. Up? I remember all the talk about the creating the. Uh, the sports car out of the Cooper and the Xerox Special. Uh, that was that was something which uh, was there. And of course, it was the start of a whole breed of uh, race cars. I mean, cars uh, like, you know, the Lolas and things wouldn't have probably been built if he hadn't have done that. Uh, it started a whole new trend. And the whole American scene of sports cars was revolutionized over that. And it became the Can-Am. Uh, Etc., which uh, you know went on uh, to where, well, perhaps it uh, by going away from that concept, it lost out uh, and came to an end. But uh, that period of the sports car race in America was absolutely fantastic. I was going to say, I mean, obviously, you, you you suffered a bad injury in America, but I always got the impression that you really loved racing in North America during that time. Yes, I, 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 I loved to go along to the Mossport and, and uh, San Jovite and all places and then across into uh, Riverside and uh, California. And no, no, I, I liked it very much. I liked, liked the cars, uh, like the uh, Lola T70, etc. It was good, con uh, good racing and good competition, but... Um, uh, yes, the accident, well, that was unfortunately a mechanical failure, uh, which uh, caused that. And, uh, you know, it had a drastic effect on my life, in a way, uh, because some of the things which happened a little after probably wouldn't have happened uh, if it hadn't been for that accident. 
John, I, th I think I know where this one's going to go, but if you have to choose between Dan, Roger Penske and AJ Foyt, where, where would your vote go? Uh, well, uh, uh, it has to be Dan. Uh, but that's good choice too. But a good choice too. It has to be Dan because uh, uh, the others are both very worthy candidates as such, and they've done tremendous things in their own right. But uh, you know, Dan, uh, you know, was also someone who um, I uh, remember uh, well from those times and uh, it was so nice to see him actually come over and celebrate his uh, time at Goodwood uh, just uh, three years ago. Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It should be said also that Dan was the only um, personality uh, to be nominated in more than one category for the Hall of Fame this year because he was also in the Formula One category and he got very close to being in the top three for Formula One which says a lot for Dan in terms of that versatility and how much he put into the sport in every yeah. area. So. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm worried that uh, we are almost out of time, but I just want to briefly touch on rallying. And the top three nominees in that category, England's only world champion, Richard Burns, nine-time WRC champion, Sebastian Loeb, and 1983 champion, Hanu Mikola. Were, were you ever tempted to, to get onto the gravel and, and do some rallying, John, when, when you were racing, or was it, were you just too focused on, on the programs you had? Uh, basically, I spent most of my time trying to stay out the gravel. <laughs> yeah. uh, I uh, must say that I was rather single-minded. Uh, it was a case of where I'd never seen a, a car race uh, before I r sat in that car at Goodwood for my first ever race. So uh, that was a, a beginning, and then it was for that year, of course, two wheels and four wheels, so not much time to look around. Obviously, you come across people uh, in the sport, the Paddy Hopkirks and these sort of people, but, uh, and you interested in looking at the odd result, but I never really followed it. And so, really, I'm the wrong person to go along and ask an opinion on, because I would, uh, frankly, uh, I'm not qualified enough to actually come along and make a decision on this. Well, Damien, I'll throw this one over to you then. If, you, if your, your vote was the, uh, the important one, where, where would it go? I think with the guys who've been nominated, um, my heart would go with Richard Burns because of the impact he had on, on the sport from a British point of view. And, and in many ways, he was the, the ice to Colin McRae's fire, I always thought, and the way his approach was very different to Colin. They were around at the same time, you know, fierce competitors, uh, and, and friends off, off, off the stages. Um, and um, I think you know, the, the loss of Richard to the sport and the way he died was, um, has, has left a, a huge hole. So uh, as I say, my heart would go with, with Richard, but in terms of uh, my head, it would have to be Loeb, I think, as a, as a, as a competitor and to, to win and change the sport really the way he has. Um, and again, the great thing about him is it's not only the nine WRC titles, it's the fact that he's won at Pikes Peak um, he's taking on Rallycross now. He made a huge impression on the Dakar this year. Um, he was also a great Le Mans driver. You know, he, he could, um, could have could have taken a, a Le Mans win um, in the in the in the mid uh, mid decade um, ten years ago. Um, so, um, and I think if he turned his hand to Formula One again, he probably would have uh, he would have been competitive given given an opportunity. So, um, it's it's hard not to think of Loeb as as uh, as a colossus of the sport really in terms of the modern era. It's interesting, I thought his Dakar experience uh, this year was very similar to Collins, who faster stage time, faster stage time, faster stage time, crash. <laughs> it was sort of a typical rally driver who's just immediately on the pace, but on the ragged edge. The other thing that's noticeable about the Hall of Fame uh, in the rally category is it's all from, uh, I mean, um, Mickler's from the 80s, 70s and 80s. Uh, and obviously Loeb and Burns are from the modern eras. Um, so the, the great rally years of the, the 50s and 60s, um, which were, you know, rallying was very different, I think, in those days. It was a really grueling uh, uh, arm of the sport where you know, we went on for days and many miles across different terrains. Um, that that uh, has been less popular uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the drivers from that era. It's been the, the, the slightly more modern eras, I think, that have seemed to have um, uh, inspired our readers with their votes. Um, but um, uh, the, 
I think the 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 the, the drama and the romance of rallying in the 60s has always appealed to me in terms of th th there's a real adventure about starting the REC in Glasgow or Poland or wherever and, and, and you, you finally got to Monte Carlo uh, after d after days and weeks of actually driving uh, to do the competitive bit it was a, a, you know, a great sport and uh, it's, it's changed I think as, as much if not more than, uh, than even Formula 1 now, John, I, uh, t I'm just going to fire one more question at you, um, and I'm going to ask you this one. It's extremely left field, um, but the reason why I like it is because I never would have thought of asking it myself. Oh, right. um, this is from someone called Manuel Zamora, who um, I think is certainly Spanish when you hear the question. And he says, have you got any memories of racing MVs in Parque del Retiro in Madrid in the 1950s? Um, he in said it's the atmosphere, the fans, the, the circuit in Madrid. In Madrid? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, I remember, uh, of course, Barcelona, two things uh, I uh, recall. Uh, I recall um, Barcelona, uh, the uh, circuit in the park there. Uh, that was uh, always very special. I mean, they had bikes and cars. And then you had the uh, Madrid as well. Uh, no, the, as you've seen, uh, particularly in the motorcycling world, uh, the amount of enthusiasm which comes out of Spain. And, of course, in recent times, the uh, superb riders, it's been you know, quite incredible. But uh, the enthusiasm there uh, was, I suppose, the only other place where you've got sort of enthusiasm like that uh, is very similar to what mo happened at Monza. Uh, and uh, with the Italians, and so uh, it, uh, yeah, racing in Spain, a uh, special uh, uh, the Madrid event. The Madrid event was one which uh, f frightened me uh, uh, somewhat. It didn't frighten me so much about the riding, but when they were erecting that stand on the outside of that left hand corner, uh, before the straight, uh, and I was told that uh, General Franco was going to be in it. I suggested that it wasn't the nicest place for him to be, uh, as it could easily be a sort of place where he could end up with a, a motorcycle or rider in his lap. Uh, so, um, but that was a thing. But I remember coming round this corner, and you come to the straight. And uh, you didn't see a straight. All you saw was people. But the people went apart to let you through. I mean, that was, that was quite frightening, uh, that side, because there was certainly uh, no crowd control and certainly no sort of barriers and things. And so um, it was a case of... Uh, going around and making certain that you didn't hit anybody. But again, the enthusiasm was absolutely tremendous. Well, that, that sounds like the closest experience to rallying that you could, you could have had, John, because obviously the rally fans always used to come out into the road and the drivers used to pile through. What, what, what was but one moment, like this, but this, uh, this, that was exceptional, but it's very similar, uh, not to quite the extremes of uh, what happened in Madrid, but very similar uh, you had in some of the Adriatic races, when you went along to the Adriatic races, which were there uh, held in Italy, uh, and uh, the people got very enthusiastic and wanted to strain more and more, and so came in closer and closer, and so the circuit got narrower and narrower and narrower. Yeah. And so uh, that was one of those things, but uh, yeah. There's a, there's a fantastic shot in the new issue of the magazine of you at, um, in Syracuse, uh, and there's fans with their legs just dangling over the wall as you come through in your Ferrari. Really? And uh, it must have been quite a, um, a culture shock coming from very organized British race meetings to go to the continent, and it was slightly less maybe oh, haphazard. One moment, you used to be, uh, wherever you went, you'd come along and you'd have, if it wasn't fans who would get that close, it would be uh, photographers, and photographers would come along and, uh, you know, you'd virtually sort of put themselves out and uh, they sort of had to lean back to, to, for you to miss them. It was a case of where uh, 
things were uh, happened very close to the circuit in those days. Uh, it was uh, a, a case of uh, not being quite these wide runoff areas and everything else which you have today. But that's the changes uh, which have been necessary over the times. Uh, Michael T told us a story a couple of years ago um, that uh, his he had a great memory of Fanjo that um, he was standing uh, taking pictures at a, at a particular point, basically at the breaking point to a corner, and uh, eventually he decided to move to another spot. And Fanjo actually had a, a rare spin. And after the, the race, he saw Michael in the paddock and he pointed at him and said, you moved. And he'd obviously been using Michael as his breaking yeah. point. <laughs> oh, well, that's one of the things which you, uh, I learned in earlier years, it's certainly when I went to the Isle of Man. You didn't go along as there was any points which could move. <laughs> you had to get something more solid, you know, like uh, uh, a uh, lamp post or a, a phone box or something like that. But you didn't go along with people because that is very, very easy. John, we really must wrap things up there. Um, can I just say thank you so much for joining us for t what was t more than an hour and yeah. so eloquently talking about all the nominees for the Hall of Fame. Um, Damien, thank you very much. Alan, thank you for uh, making this all sound a lot better than I am professional. Um, don't forget, everyone, that you can join us on Tuesday, May 31st at the Royal Automobile Club's Woodcut Park Estate in Surrey. And you can buy tickets for the Hall of Fame on the website, which is motorsportmagazine.com forward slash hall of fame um you can be there john you're going to be there t t as well it's uh, yes i'm uh, getting back i've got to uh, be in italy actually uh, for uh, because there's a special mv augusta uh, event taking place and as a tall man uh, who uh, was my sort of chief mechanic and uh, partner in in creating the success with the mv augusta uh, died this year uh, is partly to uh, celebrate his life so I'm just about getting back from that to be with you it's great that you can join us and of course your MV Augusta will be going up the hill as well during the afternoon so I hopefully will see as many of you as possible on Tuesday 31st thank you for listening thank you to everyone here and I'll see you next time bye bye